Good afternoon, everybody. How are you doing today? Um, it was, I do believe, in March of 2008 when I first met Ian Beard that he told me about a ship called the CSS Pontchartrain. And I'd never heard of it before. And that started a little over a two-year journey that my wife, I think, uh, regrets I ever had <laughs> at times. But uh, I really have to say that, I, that the uh, Old State House Museum staff and this room, um, as part of our project, has had a lot of history, and we'll kind of talk about that. Uh, the CSS Pontchartrain, it's been kind of a thing for me to, to give back to my father, who was a, who was a big Civil War um, history buff, and to kind of show him that all those years of stuff that he dra drug me all across the United States going to Civil War sites wasn't lost. So it was a pleasure to do this, to kind of show him that he did make a difference in my life and all the people that worked on this project. It was a, a kind of a unique experience. So I'd like to kind of tell you about the ship. Now, when we first started off, this was pretty much the information that was available on the CSS Pontchartrain, this in about a paragraph. It was originally called, it was a side wheel steamer. Um, it was built in 1859 in New Albany, Indiana, and it was called the Lizzie Simmons. Uh, she was 204 feet long. She was 36 feet, six inches wide, and needed six feet, six inches of water underneath her to be able to make her way up the river. Uh, once that she became a, uh, a, a war, ship of war, there are different reports that she had between five and seven guns. Uh, two of them, at least two of them, were 32-pounders. Now, some historical information that we have on the ship. As a Lady Simmons, she was built in New Albany, Indiana. She was named after a widow that lived near Camden, Arkansas. Uh, one of the reports that we found that, as, as the tradition, when a ship was named after you, uh, the, per the benefactor would buy like a tea set or a water service. Miss Simmons uh, spared no expense and made the ship very, very luxurious from some of the reports. One of the main things about this ship is they had a, a, a French milled uh, mirror that ran the length of the entire back cabin, over 30 feet long on the ship. And she even had China on the ship that was named Lizzie Simmons. Uh, George Hamilton Kirk of New Orleans was the first owner and cap uh, he was the captain and a man named Maurice Langhorn served as, as its clerk. It was involved in a, in a uh, lawsuit in Louisiana. It was probably, if had not been for this, it actually was a, a set of precedents in Louisiana law that uh, Mr. Kirk actually owned the city insurance of Cincinnati, Ohio, $537, and he used the ship as collateral. However, when they came to collect, uh, Mr. Kirk and the uh, Lizzie Simmons were nowhere to be found, so they took the wife to court. And the judge ruled that the wife was not... Um, eligible to speak on behalf of her family even though it was community property. So the city, uh, the insurance company had to pretty much, they lost the court, the case, and lost the appeal. Uh, it sailed usually between New Orleans and the Washita River Run all the way up to Camden, Arkansas as a packet steamer. And this is the earliest known uh, information I've ever been able to find on the, on the uh, Lizzie Simmons, and it's from the New Albany Daily Ledger on October 20, 1859. And it pretty much says that Lizzie Simmons is another New Albany clipper highly appreciated by every man, woman, and child down south, and to be one of New Albany, Albany's fairest specimens of steamboat architecture. In fact, it is said that Dan Hipple and George B. Spurrier had just let themselves out on her cabin ornaments. Tell the boys that everything works to a charm, and it worries any of them to catch her. Captain Kirk is as proud as he could be of his young, uh, as he would be of, as a young wife. And so it kind of leaves the impression that the Lizzie Simmons was a fairly new vessel at this point in time. Uh, we've actually, ch I've checked up in New Albany and they don't actually have a date when the vessel was actually christened, but we think this is fairly new. Uh, the, the next article I actually found was four days later in the same newspaper. Apparently there was a, um, a, competing, a competitor, a newspaper called the Louisville Courier that actually claimed the Lizzie Simmons was made in Louisville. And they went on to say that the reporter knew that it was a New Albany boat and had never been within four miles of uh, Louisville. And the article, I think, then went into kind of question the, uh, the reporter's, the legitimacy of his parents' marriage before he was born. So um, it was some kind of interesting reading at the time. Now, the vessel was uh, purchased in 1861 by a Mr. W.B. Richardson and uh, W.C. Porter served on the clerk. Uh, she had a sister ship at that point in time, and the ship was named the Mary E. King. 
this is one of the first images that we had of the Mary E. King. And from all intensive, from what we can tell, the Lizzie Simmons was probably a little bit of a nicer boat because Captain Richardson actually chose to sail on that boat and let somebody else pilot the other vessel. Uh, now, it, the Lizzie Simmons was actually sold to the Confederate States Navy on October 12th of 1861 and would eventually become part of the uh, Mississippi River Fleet. Now, she was commissioned as a gunboat and was ready for service in March of 1862. She was commissioned as a CSS Pontchartrain, as were several vessels at that point in time named after waterways in the state of Louisiana. Uh, First Lieutenant John W. Dunnington was the commander of the vessel, and he was the only man to actually serve as the commander for the, the Pontchartrain. Uh, she was assigned to the fleet under Flag Officer G. N. Hollis of the Confederate States Navy for the defense of the Mississippi River and for the Louisiana coast. Now, Mary E. Keene was also purchased by the Navy, and she served as a transport as part of the support fleet, and her career ended um, for, with Lieutenant Brown in the CSS Arkansas. She was actually destroyed as the CSS Arkansas made her run down the Yazoo River towards the Mississippi. Now, part of her service, uh, the CSS Pontchartrain fought at Island Number 10 as part of the Confederate fleet. Uh, and in New Madrid, Missouri in March and April of 1862. Uh, she lost, actually, during that time, they lost two, actually, members of the crew. The first was a 14-year-old uh, powder monkey during a battle at a place called Point Pleasant. Uh, the newspaper articles suggest that the, conf uh, the Union troops, uh, some of them may have dressed in women's clothing and had a white flag until the flag got within 40 yards, and then they fired directly upon the ship and killing one of the uh, powder monkeys at the very front of the boat. Uh, the, the Pontchartrain returned fire, and uh, the, the skirmish was over relatively quickly. Uh, now, after the fall of New Madrid, there were two vessels that were sent to Arkansas. And it was kind of interesting to try to figure out why they didn't actually stay with the rest of the fleet. Um, the CSS Pontchartrain and the CSS Maripas were sent to the rivers of Arkansas in April, May of 1862. Um, and the CSS Pontchartrain arrived in Little Rock in either late May or early June of 1862. It's kind of very interesting to find out that Arkansas at the time of the Civil War, when the Pontchartrain came to the state, it was not, it was in dire straits. Uh, there was rumors in some of the newspapers as I first started this research that my one question was, why did the boat come here? Why did they send a gunboat all the way to, all the way to Little Rock? There, were talk, there was talk of actually seceding back away from the Confederacy. Arkansas was one of the most furthest capitals to the west, and we were out here by ourselves. So they've been kind of talked that the boat was actually sent here to kind of bolster the spirits of the local Confederate government to show support. Now, there's been some talk about how much armoring was on the CSS Pontchartrain uh, when she was, if there was any. And we found out from some of the reports that there was some type of armor on the vessel. It wasn't an ironclad completely in the sense, and it wasn't a timber clad. It was somewhere in between. Um, from, the very, from the information that we've received from when the, the uh, vessels were purchased by the Confederate Navy, they actually armored them with wood and railroad iron around the engines, wheel housings, and the bow was actually strengthened with iron for ramming. Uh, the armor was most likely installed at New Orleans as she was prepared for military service. And some of the reports that we have from the official Navy records of the navies of the Civil War state that the reports that they were also armoring, putting additional armor at here in Little Rock. Uh, some of the reports that we have is actually a civilian diary from 1862 on May 24th, um, which, say, which a gentleman actually says that a, a gunboat came to defend the, the place on that day. The engine and boiler only pro are protected by iron casemates, and she had three guns. And it's widely believed that that is the actual poncho train. Uh, in February 6th of 1863, the Thomas Southridge, who was the commander of the USS Conestoga, stated that the ship is rep represented as being casemated with 20 inches of wood and railroad iron to abate her wheels. So there were some armor locations. And what we believe, these were the general areas in which the poncho train was actually armored. Now, in 1862, the uh, Battle of St. Charles was fought here in Arkansas. Uh, it was fought on the Saint, at St. Charles on the White River. Uh, Dunnington and the crew of the Pontchartrain did fight at the battle, and some of the cannons were there. 
Uh, the, CS, the CSS Maripas and two other vessels were destroyed by the Confederates to block the river channel unsuccessfully. And the USS Mound City was struck by a shell, which is oftentimes called the most deadliest shot of the Civil War. Uh, it is believed that one of the shots, and you can actually see the Mound City being actually hit, was struck by one of the 32-pound guns uh, from the CSS Pontchartrain and the crew that actually served upon her. Now, in 1863, we had a battle called the Battle of Arkansas Post, and it was uh, the Union forces actually captured the fort on January 12th of that year. At least 34 members of the CSS Pontchartrain crew, including the commander officer, was captured. From that day forward, the boat only had a minimal amount of crew members left. Uh, from January 12th of 1863 until she was actually destroyed in September, of 1863, she was pretty much a boat without a crew. Um, one of the very funny things is that um, when Dunnington actually fought in this battle, he was actually placed, he had a dual commission. He was a first lieutenant in the Confederate States Navy and a colonel in the Confederate States Army. And he refused to surrender to a Union Army officer because he, he stated that he was a Confederate naval officer and demanded to surrender to someone who was in the Navy. And so they allowed him to do that. They were actually uh, sent to uh, up north and paroled in May of that year, but the Confederacy never sent another crew for the ship. Now, Little Rock fell to Union forces on September 10, 1863. The CS Pontchartrain was destroyed with what has been called now as the Little Rock Fleet, and we'll discuss that a little bit later on. Some say, state, uh, sources say that it was destroyed by the USS General Price. And this has been a very big thing that we had to do a lot of math and a lot of uh, reading and find out. But I can tell you that General Price did, did destroy the boat. However, it was the man and not the ship. Um, we found out that uh, the, at that point in time when the um, poncha train was destroyed, the USS General Price was in Cairo, Illinois, being, uh, going through some repairs from hitting another ship by mistake. And it was the actual general who was in charge of Little Rock at the time, Confederate General Sterling Price, who ordered the destruction of the ship. Uh, in actuality, if the, um, the gunboat, the USS General Price, could have gotten this close, it couldn't have gotten past the bar at the time. And so she wouldn't have been within about 45 miles of the vessel before when it was destroyed. Uh, Dunnington and most of the crew were not at the vessel at the time. And we know of at least one crew member who was captured here in Little Rock by the Union forces, who was a member of the CSS Pontchartrain crew. And the records can tell us that. Now, the Little Rock fleet, uh, it wasn't a fleet um, by any stretch of the imagination other than it was more than three vessels together. Uh, any vessel that was here in Little Rock was destroyed by Confederate forces to keep the Union, Union from getting their hands on them, whether it was a civilian vessel or a military vessel. The CSS Pontchartrain, even though that it didn't have a crew, um, it had probably seen the end of its service life by about a year um, on a good day, not to mention that she'd been through a lot of different areas and had a lot more weight put on her, was having to be pumped dry by some of the reports that we see in, Feb in February just to stay afloat every single day. Um, the, people wanted a shot at her. They feared the boat, even though that it wasn't without a captain. And one thing you can see is even though that I've seen like a page where it says the crew was captured, and then three pages later in the Union reports, they're afraid that the commanding officer who's actually been captured is going to bring her down and try to cross the bar at Pine Bluff. They wanted to crack at this ship, and, and they had seen after the destruction of the Confederate fleet in Memphis that the uh, federal forces were able to raise several ships and put them into federal service. So they decided to destroy every ship that they actually could. Uh, we had the CSS Pontchartrain, the CSS St. Francis, the CSS Tahlequah, and the CSS Bracelet. The other vessels were the Little Rock, the Arkansas, the Julia Roan, and the Chester Ashley. I have uh, some articles well, I'll share with everybody. I have some copies, and if, if I don't have enough, if you'll send me your email address, I will forward them to you. But we do know that from what we can tell from an article written in 1884 that I believe the Little Rock and the Julia Roan were almost directly behind the Old State House Museum and across the river from the Pontchartrain when she went up. And they were destroyed. The commanding, the two captains told how the Confederate forces kicked in the doors, took the sheets off, took the beds, threw them on the ground, covered everything in kerosene, and set them ablaze. 
Now, some eyewitness dis- accounts of the destruction of the Pontchartrain. This, no one ever gave us any type of coordinates or exactly where it was. So when I first started, this was some of the information that I looked at to determine where the boat possibly could be at. General Frederick Steele, in his report, um, after on September 12th, a few days after the boat was actually destroyed, all I really got from him was that there were actually six boats that were totally destar- destroyed by fire. They had actually tried to burn some of the pontoon bridges, and some were actually saved. Captain Thomas Stevens, no relation, but uh, he, uh, he actually wrote that the rebels burned a train of cars and an ironclad gunboat in several buildings. Um, and there are also two small steamboats will be useful when the water is at a higher is higher. And this was very interesting to me. Four days after the ship had been destroyed, it said the river now is very low. A man or horse can wade it. So it let me know that it was probably less than six and a half feet. The poncha train, once she got to Little Rock, probably was never able to leave because the river was so low. Major William E. Woodruff Jr., who was the son of a newspaper icon who actually commanded the Pulaski Artillery and the Bull Battery. Um, in his book called With the Light Gun 61 to 65 was the very, one of the very first things that we actually found. And it really kind of, this was something because this was a local boy and he, he actually rode to a section in the street when he thought they were actually burning the town. He rode to, um, when he got to Rector Avenue where his house is still over in that area, he saw that they were behind him. He went to the corner of, uh, down to Markham and Main Streets and discovered that the smoke was caused by the burning of the old gunboat uh, poncha train and the uh, Captain Jinks brown boat, the Little Rock, on the south bank of the river just northeast of the state house. Both were totally destroyed. But he told us that you know, a local person who knew this area told us that the, the boat was on the opposite side of the river. So that was the one thing that let us know that this is where it was at. Now, Mr. Uh, musician Andrew Sperry, in his book, the, 30 th- uh, the History of the 33rd Iowa Volunteer Infantry Regiment, he was talking about on this day was the rebels were burning their cars and steamboats into some government buildings. An ironclad gunboat had ascended the river some months before, but the fall of the water had left it high and dry on the sand. It now is but a shapeless mass of burning ruins. So we knew that the river was pretty much, it was probably very close to the riverbank and that it was actually stuck in the mud. There was no water around it when she actually burned. Another one said that the water is very shallow, about three and a half to five feet deep. Um, A few boats lie on the riverbed and the ruins of a vast gunboat is yet still burning on September 11th. There is a good lot of railroad iron that has been used for coating many, uh, for coating many shot and shell lies scattered about. Her guns had been removed. And finally, one of the last ones we actually got uh, was, uh, this is uh, written by, from a diary from, uh, from September 20th, approximately 10 days after the ship had been destroyed. The CSS Pontchartrain, or the boat, had a pair of the most powerful cylinders I ever saw and the stoutest wheel shafts I'd ever saw, but there lays a perfect wreck. The iron is all spoiled except for the railroad iron, and that is still good yet. When we started looking, this is one of the first things we found that kind of let us know. And the gentleman who actually was in charge of the Daily Gazette at that point in time was actually a fellow officer along with um, Major Woodruff during the Civil War with the Pulaski Artillery. Um, and he said this, they were talking about the river, and this is in the river section of the July 21st, 1871 Daily Gazette. Yesterday was clear and, of course, very hot with little air stirring. The river is now getting, again, very low and continues to fall, though the rise of one inch was recorded yesterday morning. The top of the old gunboat, Pontra Train, sunk in the river opposite the city, can be seen. The catfish are now traveling on dry land, and some are said to be taking passage on the railroad. So. Now, that's the information that we had had. Um, this is pretty much, that was a lot of the information that we had discovered, and we thought we knew in a general area where it was. We could pretty much say that if you stood at those, that, that intersection, where it had to be. And so these are some of the recent developments that kind of even before we started the project that sparked some interest in the poncha train again. There was an Arkansas River Survey and Assessment. Uh, it was conducted by the Pan American Consultants in 2006. It was done under contract for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Arkansas State Lands Commission. 
they were looking on expanding the channel in certain parts of Arkansas. And the, uh, they wanted to make sure that they knew there were several ships that were lost in the Arkansas, in Little Rock area, during the Civil War and the periods before and after. So they did a survey with magnetometers, and the survey led to, to some unknown targets that were believed to be the CSS Pontchartrain or the Halley uh, from the Brooks-Baxter wartime period. Uh, they did an underwater assessment from April 10th to April 13th of 2007, and here's a map. It's a little bit bigger here. It shows you some of the areas. You can actually see where you see the blue lines are the actual bridges that go across the Arkansas River. Um, any area that's kind of red is they believe is could be some areas that were either the bridge, the metal in the bridge was sounding back, or they were getting some interference and feedback. They did get three main hit targets just below the Broadway Bridge, just downstream. And everything, everyone had heard that they may have found the poncho train at that point in time. Well, what they had found was the barge. And this is a sonar, this is a, a, a side scan sonar image of the actual barge they found. And when they found it, they thought it looked like an, up, an upside down steamboat, which it did. This is actual an image of the actual, the bridge bent of the Broadway Street Bridge uh, facing downstream. You can actually see where the word says flow, that's the actual channel. And it actually is buried, part of the boat's actually buried underneath the river bank itself. A diver actually walked down into the river, and I actually had a chance to talk to the diver, and he said, you know, the neat thing is once you get about seven feet down, the river becomes, you can see about 25 feet in front of you. And he walked up and was actually able to see, and they determined that it was a, a probably around a 1900 to a 1920s uh, barge that no one knew had actually been lost before. And probably, they said, maybe even during the Great Flood of 27, that it could have been lost at that point in time. But it was determined based upon, and you can actually see some of the lines of the boards, and they determined that it was not the way that a steamboat was built at the time. And so it was determined that it was not either the Pontchartrain or the Halley or any of the other vessels of the, the quote-unquote fleet, but just a regular tow barge. Now, when we started this project of trying to find the Pontchartrain, I got told by a lot of people that I probably wouldn't find anything. Um, and so we had to be very realistic that, you know, there was probably not a chance that we were going to find anything. We knew there were going to be a lot of challenges. You know, some of the challenges were lack of our experience because we had, the folks who were a part of this group had never done anything like this before. Uh, lack of project funding. Um, I can honestly say that we were a quintessential nonprofit organization. Um, my wife was very, very um, understanding at times and let me buy things that I probably shouldn't. <laughs> and uh, we funded this really just pretty much uh, by just a small group of people. In all honesty, my change jar funded the project. I sold things on eBay and things like that and were able to buy books that other people didn't have to find these things. The lack of search equipment. Uh, we had to borrow a metal detector at one point in time to even be able to find anything. Some of the other things, but there were different locations where the CSS Pontchartrain might be. And there were, several, uh, there were several vessels lost in the Arkansas River at Little Rock. And finally, you know, some, the one thing I had to really realize is that there was a very good chance the vessel no longer existed. You know, that was something I was really going to have to really, and it was hard for me to think about that, but that was the one thing I always had to keep circling is it's probably not there anymore or it no longer exists. You know, there's been wrecks and rumors of wrecks. Um, there have been many discussions of where it's been. Uh, if you do some searches on the internet, they will say that it was sunk anywhere from Pine Bluff to the Natural Steps, just past Not Mall Mail. Uh, that it was loaded full of gold. Uh, there's a lot of things that they would tell you that. Um, no exact location of coordinates were ever given. There were no pictures taken of the ship after it burned. Um, you know, the first-hand accounts that we had in the period maps were probably the best thing that could help us. This is a listing of the vessels lost in the Arkansas River near or in the proximity of Little Rock. Um, vessels lost in a non-Civil War period is a pretty extensive list. Uh, we have the, a boat called the Mall Mel. Uh, during our research, we actually found that that's another boat that no one knew had actually been sank until we found a newspaper article and someone actually sent it to me. And uh, it was actually sank purposely by the railroad. 
If they got a chance, they would buy their competition up, fill it full of boulders, and sink it. And they had one more vessel that they couldn't compete with the train. So there were some other vessels sank. On the other side, during the Civil War, there were several vessels, to include two Union vessels, that were lost in and around Little Rock during the Civil War. Can you imagine being in the state capitol on a Union vessel and you hit a snag and sink? One vessel was lost within about a month of, of war being declared, of the Civil War beginning, and that was the Ella. But these were the vessels that were all lost. So as we looked at this, we thought, you know, if we find something, are we going to know it's the Pontchartrain or not? Um, the one thing that we could determine is that the Pontchartrain, based on its sheer size and looking at a detailed listing of every ship lost in the state of Arkansas, uh, by four feet and by its sheer tonnage was the largest warship ever lost in the state. And so we knew that it was going to be a big boat. Sure. It's the, uh, it's, the, it's the Arkansas, the CSS Bracelet, the Chester Ashley, the Julia Rome, the Little Rock, the CSS Pontchartrain, the CSS St. Francis Number 3, and the Tahlequah. The two Union vessels were the Ella and the Quapaw. Now, the vessel no longer exists. We know the vessel was burned to prevent it from being captured. Some reports that we, we saw say the vessel burnt between one and three days. You know, the vessel and any remains that could have been on that ship it might have been completely destroyed. And, and honestly, one thing that one of the very first things I had to admit is that the river here in Little Rock has undergone many projects and has been dredged repeatedly in the downtown area over the years. And, you know, I'd also heard reports of, you know, of people telling me that there were times when people used to drive cars up and down the river bank when the river was really low. So I knew that if there was something exposed, I was between the ages of 6 and 12. If I could have got my hand on a sunken Civil War boat and played, I would have. And I just thought of how many generations of, of people and adults may have done the same thing. Now some of the successes. Prior to the start of this project, there was no, no image, pictures, or drawings, or sketches of the vessel prior to the start. Um, in August of 2009, Doing a search on Google, as, as most of this information I found, and that's one of the neatest things about this project, about 97% of everything we found could have been found by anyone sitting at a computer at home. And I think that was amazing. But it was the same search I did 150 other times, but instead of when I typed in Lizzie Simmons, I typed in books. And on page 18 of my search, <laughs> I, uh, I found a, an obscure mention of the vessel in the Ohio Historical Societies. I contacted the society, and it took them about three weeks to actually find it, but they were able to locate a document, which was a bill of fare, which is a menu from the boat. And they sent it to me. They said they were going to send it to me. I sent them a, and they said, it, it's going to cost you a, a good little bit of money. And I was like, well, how much is this going to cost? And she's like, you know, $5. <laughs> and I said, I will, send you a, I will send you a check for 20 just mail it to me. And I say, can you tell me if there's a, a picture of a boat anywhere on this bill of fare? She goes, oh, yes, there's one on the front cover. And I had to travel to New York on business, and it was coming from Ohio, and my wife was the actual one she got in and sent, it, sent me a picture on my camera, so I had a little bitty picture of the boat. And this is the only known drawing of the Lizzie Simmons that we do have. And that is what she looked like. Now, it was located on the bill of fare. It listed the food available to the passengers in the dining times. And the bill of fare is pretty neat itself because it will actually tell you apparently they ran out of roast beef or pork chops on the vessel, so they crossed it out, but a deer had gotten shot along the way, so they have venison chops written in over the top of it. Uh, so it kind of, as things ran out, they changed it. Uh, it does list that George H. Kirk was the master. And we have a pretty good idea, and I talked to a gentleman who was in, from New Orleans, and he stated that the ship, the reason this was such a good thing is because New Orleans was a dual language city, and a lot of people couldn't read. So when you bought and booked passage on the ship, they gave you a bill of fare, and a lot of times it was one of the few ways to actually identify the ship that you were going to be riding on. But this is what the original owner of the vessel stated that his ship looked like, or was the closest representation that we have. Now, objects found, and let me be the first to say that we did find some objects in February of this year. 
there is probably no way that we'll ever be able to determine whether they came off the poncha train. Um, we went out to do a simple search to practice, and no one really thought we were going to find anything, and we did. Um, they were located on the north side of the river on some private property, and um, they were pretty neat. Uh, they were located by a young lady named Amy Duncan. She is the second one from the right there in the baseball cap, the first time she'd ever used a metal detector. Uh, the very first thing that we found was a ship's bell, and this is a few seconds after coming out of the ground. Um, we thought this was the neatest part. We were amazed. Uh, we pulled it out, and it looked great. The bell was found upside down. It's between five and six inches tall. It looks like what has a small bullet hole in the center of the side, and there's also a large crack in the main body. We thought this was the neatest part of the entire thing. This was everything. We also found a little bottle. And when I first pulled it out, it has an oil, almost like a sheen to it. It looked like it's covered in oil. Um, someone has told me that it's, a, it's more of an 1840s crockery style that they did when they did the glaze on it. When we first pulled it out, the only reason why we kept it is when you touched it with a metal detector, about six or seven different types of metals registered across this thing. I actually thought it was a, a Civil War artillery shell when I first found it because you were looking down the top of it, and I was like, uh-oh, this looks like a Hotchkiss shell. Let's stop for a second. Uh, but we actually found out that it was a bottle. You know, the bottle was found in the position just like it's shown. It was actually found, and there was three rocks kind of surrounding it. Uh, there was a small rock in the top of it, and um, we really didn't think too much about it, but when we started to clean the bottle here at the old state house in the cleaning closet by the women's bathroom, <laughs> uh, we actually, it became very excited. There was a small rock that was carved and placed into the top of the bottle, and we first opened it. We saw an object, and as you see, it, it looked like a bug. That's what we thought it really was, and it took us about five minutes but we were able to extract a Civil War era pocket knife. Uh, the knife is all metal and very similar to the C.F. Woolert's company knives made from that era. We were pretty excited at that point in time, but further cleaning after it was very heavy, and as we continued to clean it out, the bottle literally threw up. I mean, the mud, it, it all of a sudden just coughed up a bunch of stuff, and when it hit, um, there were, you could see gold and a few other things, and everybody in the room, and there was about four people in the room, and then there was about 12 people in the room, it felt like. Um, we, all of a sudden, there were bullets, marbles, buttons, um, and other objects were discovered. And this is taken within about 10 seconds of, it for, of, it, of the stuff actually falling out into the strainer there. The bottle and the contents, you can actually, there are four marbles up in the upper uh, right-hand corner. There were five buttons found. Three of them had naval designs. One was actually a Union naval button, and then some other ones. The pocket knife, a, a sword hanger, a, 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 a rifle bullet, a pistol ball. And then this item is probably believed, it's probably one of the uni more unique items right here. A Confederate serpentine belt buckle is what they believe it is. Um, and so these are all the items that we were found there, and that's the items that we located in the river. Now the wreck site. Um, we've con we continue to search and look and search and think that we you know, try to really go over maps. And the one thing, I've got the actual map up here in the very front of the class, but in the thing, we go back to 1864. This is a military map drawn by the Union Army of North Little Rock, our, uh, our Little Rock opposite of there. We can see that there's actually the Little Rock, you can see it protruding out there, and a military pontoon bridge across the river. It's a pretty good idea. This is what the scene looked like in 1864, just a, almost about a year and two months after the vessel was destroyed. We think that roughly the poncha train from the reports and everything that we had received would be generally in this area right in here. The one street, it's very, on this thing, it's very faint to look out, but it's probably believed to be Main Street. Uh, once you see the one, the one line going almost north and south, it's probably going to be what is today Main Street in North Little Rock. But this is a good representation of, um, of what North Little Rock looked at the time, and so this is what the earliest maps we could see. 
Now, on March 9, 2010, I was actually at work, and a gentleman who wasn't even associated with the project, Mr. David Hogue, called, or Hodge, called me and said, you're William Stevens. Are you looking for the Lizzie Simmons? And I was like, yes. And he was like, is it your birthday? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and he told me, he said, you know, I'm doing a whole research on trains. And I found a, an article in the Arkansas Gazette from July 31st, 1904, and it's, it's entitled The History of the Lizzie Simmons. Can I send it to you? And I was like, yes. And that was probably the longest three minutes for my email to get turned on to actually get this and to sit and read it. And it was so neat. It really kind of, the one thing I can say is that this project, I did a lot of the research, but it was a community effort. You know, the person that found the most important piece of information was not part of our project. And that's, that, was, that was one of the, probably the neater things about this. Here's the opening paragraph, and I have some copies of it up here. When the Arkansas River in front of Argenta is extremely low, there may be seen projecting from the water between the end of the Free Bridge and Newton Avenue the remains of a steamboat's hull. The waters have almost entirely destroyed it, and but, and but few have seen the hulk know that it was once part of the finest boats which ever rode the American River and has as a history as romantic and an end as as tragic as any craft which has ended their careers in Davy Jones' locker. So when I saw that, I'm like, that's great. Where's Newton Avenue? Yeah. <laughs> so we actually did some more research. This is a 1913 Sanborn map of North Little Rock. The free bridge we found out uh, pretty much crossed at, if you walk out the back here, uh, at the very back of the Peabody, it crossed at an angle and ended on what is today, as you can see here, this is the free bridge, on South Maple Street. Newton Street, after 1904, became known as Main Street. So we know that you know, and I look at this article, they got the city where the, Poncha, where the Lizzie Simmons and the Poncha train was, was built, was, was not correct. But in 1904, if you walk down to the river and look down into the water when it was low, there was a vessel there. I went to the archives to actually check a few days afterwards to see if anyone questioned the validity of the writer of that's parents' lineage, you know, just to make sure, but there was no kind of complaints about it. Most of the people at that time had actually still remembered the Civil War, and these are from still first-hand accounts uh, from this article and some of the information. We, got, we found out who, li who uh, Lizzie Simmons actually was and found out in Camden that there was a wealthy widow who lived down there named Lizzie Simmons. So it was a, it was a great amount of information that answered a lot of questions and talked about the, the Lady Baxter being from the Pontchartrain. So today when we look in North Little Rock, those two streets exist. Now, one thing that we have found out in looking at the map, if we can go back just a second, we know pretty much the scale and how the distance were, was from the Arkansas Street into the river. We have found out looking at satellite images today and doing some measure, looking at current maps, that the river bank in North Little Rock has increased anywhere between 90 to 110 feet. Yes, sir. Oh, five, five minutes. minutes. Five minutes. Great. This is that area today. Based on the information that we'd had and to look at everything, we believe the CSS Poncha train rests here. And our goal is not to dig it up. I don't think anyone ever should. There's not much left. But in our back, backyards is the largest ship ever lost in this state for a war. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you guys so much.